Доброго ранку. Good morning, dear colleagues. We start briefing. Topic is freedom of religion and occupied Donbass and Crimea. I give the floor to Alexandra Zayets, uh, head of the board of the Institute of Freedom of Religion, moderator of the round table of freedom of religion in Ukraine. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm, the representatives of the media. Good afternoon, dear representatives of religious organizations and uh, um, civil society defenders, organizations and other organizations, and uh, dear friends. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that on the 16th of April, there was the first round table on uh, religious freedoms in Ukraine. This was the first uh, event attended by representatives of NGOs. And uh, these are different components of civil society and uh, religious organizations, representatives, and human rights defenders organizations and other NGOs. The topic of this round table was the situation, religious situation, in the occupied territories, territories that are occupied by Russia, Crimea, and Donbass. More than 70 representatives took part uh, who represent NGOs. They shared opinion concerning this topic. And based on the results of this round table, a resolution was adopted. You have it. This is the revolution, uh, resolution on religious freedom in the Ukrainian territories of Crimea and Donbass, occupied by the Russian Federation. In this resolution, the situation is described that is now in these territories, and recommendations are provided to different international organizations. Also, the last point of, the, of this resolution is to resolve this issue, and uh, in order to do this, we should uh, hold another round table, and uh, it should be att attended by uh, NGOs, uh, those who support uh, religious freedoms, and uh, to uh, bring together representatives of uh, NGOs and the local and uh, national authorities to gather efforts of NGOs and uh, the state in order to reach um, justice and uh, uh, to uh, have respect to human dignity. Also, we plan to carry out other events. This is the first topic, the first result of the work of this roundtable. We plan other topics, and they will be discussed with the participants of the roundtable. And in June, we are going to have a next event, and we will accumulate our efforts. We will join the efforts of different organizations in order to reach proper results about this resolution. You have references to Russian and English versions of this resolution. Thank you for attention, and now I give the floor to other participants of our press conference. Now the floor is given to Alexa Petrov, Director of the Department of External Communications in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian Greek and Catholic Church, uh, Mike Tritt, uh, Archpriest of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to greet all the participants of this public event, which is important. I would like uh, uh, to continue representing uh, this good uh, intention, this good starting of a regular round table uh, as a platform which will provide the opportunity uh, 
for discussions of about real situation and to provide information to the world's community and to demonstrate how important it is. Ukraine Greek Catholic Church from 1946 until 1989 was in underground. It was uh, liquidated by the communist regime. Uh, the persecution of our believers uh, is well described in the history of Catholic University. There are many documentaries which uh, uh, describe this history. I would like uh, to draw your attention to the international context. Our church uh, was named uh, the Silent Church because uh, it was persecuted, it was suffering, but it had no right to speak. We had no right to speak because um, various geopolitical conjuncture of those uh, years uh, uh, closed uh, the mouses to even very powerful uh, bodies, uh, so people were exiled. Uh, or if they stay in their homes, they should uh, not speak those days. They were not allowed to speak. The, the uh, history demonstrates if there is evil, again, evil deeds against someone and everyone keeps silence, then the evil uh, manifests itself and uh, it prevails. So we should prevent uh, the prevalence of evil in the world. So all sins which violate the rights of the human rights and rights of uh, uh, pe members of church. It should be demonstrated to the world's community uh, to the end of uh, provision of appraisal and also as a member of Christian Church, I should say that uh, I cannot be in peace, in spiritual peace, if uh, there is someone uh, close to me in my motherland who is suffering. Uh, people are suffering uh, because of injustice for their belief. We cannot keep silence, so launching this regular round table, I believe, is a response, adequate response to, to these needs of uh, uh, believers, uh, of those people who believe in God and who know that they will be asked for everything after death, even for their silence in case of injustice, especially in those situations in the occupied territories where there are many cases of injustice. So uh, we hope that God will give us the opportunity uh, to uh, for the triumph of justice and love. We are giving the floor to Pastor Anatoly Kazachuk, the first deputy uh, senior bishop of the Ukrainian Church of Evangelical Faith Christians. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. And the <coughs> freedom of speech and the freedom of conscience are the main principles of free society, talking about the religion situation in churches. I will be talking about evangelical churches 
which are located in the so-called uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, you know that they were asked to re-register their status so that they are identified with their so-called statehood. Uh, as of today, uh, in the so-called Lugansk People Republic, there was no statute re registered so far. In the Donetsk uh, People's Republic, I got this morning the info that one statute was re registered with uh, their authorities, but there was no purpose to register in order to provide freedom to the churches. We think that the purpose was likely just to get information about uh, the list of uh, churches and the list of churchgoers. If uh, we analyze, uh, we can say that powerful efforts have been put into clearing uh, the religious environment in, in the occupied territory so that there is only one confession which will be provided more freedom and all other confessions uh, to be pushed from these territories or to make them unlawful so that they are formally pe persecuted and they are prevented the chance of re-registration. The second uh, thing that uh, as concerns uh, breaking any links with the churches with uh, between Ukrainian churches and churches in Lugansk and Donetsk uh, regions occupied territories, there was no purpose to provide any uh, statuses to the churches in the occupied territories so that they can exercise provide people with the chance to exercise their right for uh, conscience and for religions, religion. In this context, the third thing is uh, over 60 percent of uh, uh, parishers uh, of evangelical church, they have moved to the central Ukraine or uh, they live now in the government-controlled territories uh, in the same regions where they used to live. I'm talking about evangelical environment. Uh, the number of members uh, have declined, and in those territories people moved to government-controlled territories because in the occupied territories people have no chance uh, to be believers uh, and members of church so people are looking for the opportunities to move so the reason uh, is the uh, authorities in those territories uh, try to squeeze uh, all people who uh, can think divergently. Uh, so now we think of uh, uh, appointing some coordinators uh, who will help people uh, to um, have uh, assemblies at homes where the uh, people can mm, uh, read Bible. I think that some churches maybe will be registered just to demonstrate that there is uh, some uh, freedom of conscience, but it will be fake freedom. So this is the situation. Thank you. And at the beginning, we want to hear the representatives of church organizations, and after, we will have speeches of human rights defenders. The floor is given. 
to Sheikh uh, Zwarayim, um, uh, the representative of uh, Muslim religious organizations. Good afternoon. The information that we get from the annexed Crimea and from the territories that are occupied, those that are in Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, we get information about constant persecutions of people who are against occupation and occupation authorities use repressive measures, carry out arrests, persecutions that are committed by law enforcement bodies. Also, propaganda is delivered by the media, and the situation is really bad concerning human rights in those territories concerning access to information. This is also confirmed by him and chose. Also, there are shutdowns of uh, electricity, water, gas, and uh, this is during holy Ramadan months when the biggest number of people, they gather during evenings to have some festivities. In uncontrolled territories of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, the situation is even worse. Muslims, they are persecuted and they are accused of extremism, terrorism, arrests are carried out and there are bans and prohibitions and the work of our community is blocked and our communities are not working there now. And many Muslims who are lived there, they were forced to flee and they resettled in the controlled territory and now they cannot get proper social support. So th we know this information and we know that in Crimea now now and before that there is no proper representation of Muslims body that represent them is not active. Thank you. Now, Gennady Vlaritsky, representative of Jewish religious organizations of Ukraine, legal advisor to the chief rabbi of Kiev and Ukraine. Good afternoon, everyone. Dear friends, if we are <coughs> honest and open we should start our discussion with the fact that Ukrainian churches and religious organizations have indirect influence on the processes ongoing in Crimea and in temporarily occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblasts, and these are alpha and omega of all our discussion. We cannot resolve uh, these issues concerning these people because we do not have practical mechanisms to influence those processes. But it doesn't mean that we should just sit and look and do nothing. We have three ways how to help these people, how we can stabilize the situation somehow. First way, to provide humanitarian assistance to those people, to those churches and religious organizations registered or that are not registered or that re-register. There are real people, they are citizens of Ukraine, they belong to the denominations that exist in Ukraine, and at the level of religious organizations, we should have a spiritual and humanitarian connection with them. Second, what we can do for these people, we can create conditions for those who decided to resettle. Those who decided to open new page of their life in controlled territories to help them to make this resettlement milder. The state should contribute a lot and also NGOs and religious organizations should also make proper steps in order to help these people, even big groups of people like in uh, Donetsk religious community. Many of these people resettled to Kiev region, and in Kiev there is a synagogue of those who resettled from Donetsk. We accepted these people. This is the second way how we can help, and the third way, the most important for those who stay there, the way 
of constant public discussion of those problems that exist in the territories that are outside of control of Ukraine now. We should speak to our international partners, to Russian Federation, to Ukrainian power about this problem, and we should uh, see how humanitarian issues are resolved in these territories. So we criticize the situation, and uh, also journalists provide information, and also this issue is raised constantly and discussed at international level, at different platforms. If we won't discuss it, the situation will be worse, and our task is to improve the situation. That's why we should pray and we should do everything possible in order to help them to resolve this difficult situation, and God bless us all. Also, Yevstrati Zarya will join us later, Deputy Head of the Directorate of the External Communication of the Orthodox Church. He will be later. Now we give the floor to human rights defenders, Evgeny Zaharov, Director of the Kharkiv Human Rights Group. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me for this discussion, to this discussion. I, I would like to mention three ideas that came to me after I heard the speeches of representatives of churches. First, unfortunately, it reminds me the times of Soviet power when ch uh, churchgoers were persecuted and Jehovah witnesses were banned and Baptists and other representatives of churches, they were imprisoned uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, several years on religious grounds and the uh, Muslims were persecuted and the Ukrainian Greek and Catholic Church and the uh, Ukrainian uh, autocephalous church were also banned and now we see that in temporarily occupied territories, representatives of Russian power and those who they support uh, these quasi-authorities in the occupied territories, they carry out the same policy, unfortunately. And uh, evidently, it is really important to unite efforts of uh, religious organizations and the public so, uh, civil society in order to oppose these actions. And I would like to add to those three ways mentioned by Gennady. And there is a fourth way. This is legal help to those who suffer. Those representatives of churches whose rights are violated and who suffer from these violations in the temporarily occupied territories. This is a separate discussion. We do not have time for this. But I would like to say that today, Human Rights Defenders Organization provides such assistance in Crimea. To those who are persecuted by the power and also, uh, they cooperate with human rights defenders from Russia. Moreover, in Donbass, it is important to bring attention to violations of against uh, religious communities and to initiate legal procedures. So this is Ukrainian territory. We need to do this, and we should address to Ukrainian law enforcers in order that they protect our citizens there. They should start criminal investigations against those who commit violations, and this should be done, I would like to say, also about important work, the collection of information about these violations, and uh, also legal qualification of those violations that are committed there. Our Kharkiv uh, uh, Human Rights Defenders Group carried out such work concerning different groups of population in the Donbas territory. We know that is going on in Crimea. And we came to conclusion, to the hypothesis, 
that is believable and we should carry out additional research. We can say that we see the signs of crimes against humanity, against uh, members of religious communities, against those churches that are not recognized by Moscow Patriarchate in the territory of Donbass and in the territory of Crimea. We carried out some work and uh, we believe that here we may speak about violations of uh, point H of Article 1, uh, Article 7 of the uh, Rome Statute. This is about persecution of the identified group. I would like to cite this is persecution against any person. Uh, identified group or a community based of na on national, ethnic, religious, or any other motives uh, that are recognized uh, uh, inappropriate uh, in accordance with the law and uh, um, uh, in case of violations uh, that are under jurisdiction of International Criminal Court. And uh, these persecutions are serious. Uh, violations against the rights of these persons, against uh, the uh, uh, that are uh, committed against the group or community. So the religious communities in the occupied territories, they suffer from such persecutions based on their belonging to the group. And the information that is collected, it provides grounds to say that we may see the signs of crimes against humanity, but we should gather the whole information to analyze it and uh, to prove that this is systemic and uh, comprehensive. And we should uh, uh, write to the prosecutor of International Criminal Court about this, and uh, I believe that in uh, two years uh, the full-fledged investigation will start uh, concerning those uh, military and other crimes that were committed in the territory of the armored conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yevgen. The next uh, will be Ms. Olga Skripnik, head of the board, Crimean Human Rights Group. Good afternoon. Our organization is working in the occupied Crimean territory for five years, starting with 2015, and um, primarily the uh, Crimean residents who help us uh, uh, there and uh, in the occupied Crimea and uh, in the territory of uh, <coughs> U Central Ukraine. Uh, we should say that all religious organizations were persecu persecuted except Moscow Patriarchate uh, Orthodox Christian Church. We monitor this information and on monthly basis we provide it to international NGOs and institutions. We are thankful to all our colleagues who take part today in this discussion because uh, we should find mechanisms how to help these people and what we can do to deoccupy the territory so that we can protect religious rights and other fundamental uh, human rights of uh, their residents. Uh, almost all religious organizations uh, are persecuted or their rights are limited, restricted in Crimea. Uh, strong uh, uh, sufferings were against uh, Muslims. As of today, we know that uh, 56 persons are in jail uh, in contradiction of human, international human rights uh, for the so-called their uh, membership in his uh, but those persons has nothing to do with terrorist activities and uh, religious uh, uh, attribute is used by the uh, occupation regime uh, in to persecute 
civil rights uh, advocates and uh, uh, media activists uh, and journalists. So those people who recorded on video or uh, cam uh, camera or uh, made pictures uh, of the violations by the Russian Federation. So any Muslim can become the victim of uh, this uh, occupation regime. Is this year uh, for the membership in uh, his uh, 27 people were in jail, and many of them reported tortures, and they are uh, sentenced for very long uh, terms, such as 9, 12, and 17 years in jail. Talking about other cases, Mr. Evgen said about Jegova uh, witnesses, the uh, persecution started in Crimea. 2017, when the Russian Federation decided that the witnesses of Jegova uh, are out of law, that this is an extremist organization, so there are two persons uh, uh, against whom the criminal per persecution started, uh, and uh, the searches were conducted at 10 or 20 homes. Uh, the package of Yaravoy's uh, law, laws uh, also is applicable in Crimea, and they are very absurd. The, uh, one person who invested people to the fitness training, it was uh, um, uh, fined because uh, uh, the, they decided that this person was a uh, terrorist, and and uh, also one person was sanctioned for holding the Bible in the hands. This is very absurd accusations, but these uh, penalties uh, were high, five or ten thousand rubles. So many people are afraid even to tell uh, what what their belief is. This is especially concerns uh, members of uh, Ukrainian Patriarchate uh, uh, Orthodox Church, because it was mostly persecuted in Crimea. Uh, now uh, there are only eight communities out of 40 uh, in Crimea uh, which uh, 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 which represent uh, the Ukrainian uh, Kiev Patriarchate uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, Clementi, uh, who is the uh, grace uh, uh, of uh, this uh, Crimean Orthodox Church, uh, he only stated the fact that almost all uh, Kiev Patriarchate churches' buildings uh, have been occupied. They are seized. Uh, pe uh, people in Crimea are prevented from exercising their religious freedom. They cannot uh, uh, exercise rights. Uh, the Bishop Clem Clement was not allowed to, uh, to visit the imprisoned uh, militaries in Crimea, Vladimir Baloch, a political prisoner in Crimea, Ukrainian uh, church is often used uh, to um, uh, create very severe conditions uh, in the jails in the Russian Federation. Volodymyr uh, Baloch for two months uh, is incarcerated uh, in the very uh, prison in Russia uh, for uh, being Ukrainian citizen and for being a member of Ukrainian Patriarchate uh, 
uh, Orthodox Church. So we need mechanisms and we need to develop them for the people who live in the occupied territories of Ukraine. Thank you, Ms. Olga, before giving the floor to the next representative. I would like to say that the uh, religious freedom uh, resolution of today has been supported by 25 religious organizations and 25 NGOs. Now I would like to give the floor uh, to Alexandra Matvichuk, head of the board of the Center for Civil Liberties. The channel challenges which Ukraine faces and those uh, uh, tests uh, which uh, now examine believers of various churches, uh, religious groups, and confessions could not be overcome. Uh, by a uh, single person, that is why the Institute of Freedom of Religion uh, decided to, to create the uh, permanent round table for religious freedom as a platform for discussions of these uh, challenges uh, uh, to the uh, freedom of religion. And we are very happy that various confessions and religion organizations and churches supported our idea at the round table discussion. The resolution was a Proved and it would be presented in various European countries, capitals, and in the USA. The resolution consists of two parts. The first part uh, provides the background uh, which people uh, now experience in the occupied territories of Ukraine. <clears throat> so that the context is understandable, I would like to say that we as human rights defenders register the violations, uh, the punishment of people uh, for worshiping in the places which are not uh, allowed for worship. So even if you pray or see in religious songs in the place which the authorities believe is not uh, presupposed for this, you will be punished. In the territory of Donbass, uh, people go underground uh, and they use the practices even uh, though they do not know that they use these practices. They use the practices of underground of the Second World War uh, when the uh, churchgoers uh, were uh, hidden believers. The first step to be done Next step is to develop a joint stand because occupation uh, caused uh, mass violation of uh, human rights and we want uh, to communicate this to international organizations and world community. They need uh, in uh, with use any chance to use any chance to request uh, the Russian Federation to liberate all political prisoners uh, for religious uh, pretexts texts uh, and uh, to do the occupy the territories and uh, to provide the freedom of religious and uh, to liberate people who are incarcerated in uh, the jails in Donetsk and Lugansk uh, re regions occupied territories where people are ca kept in the basement of the houses. Uh, they are in jail there. So uh, uh, we want international organizations uh, to appeal to the Russian Federation 
our recommendation uh, is uh, to also to register, to document, uh, to collect evidences uh, of violations and to draft uh, the report on the situation with human rights uh, and uh, uh, the status of believers uh, in these territories which are occupied. We want this report to to be presented in the United Nations, in the Council of Europe, in the OSCE, and in the capitals of various countries. And the third recommendation is, uh, it is not new, uh, we would like to create a new institutional mechanism for monitoring of such violations. So we would like to address the EU so that they appoint a EU special representative for the occupied Ukrainian territories of Crimea and Donbass to carry out continuous monitoring of the human rights situation and periodic public reporting to the EU Council on the State of Affairs. We call uh, on everyone to support our initiative and jointly to help people who are now in the occupied territories all alone with the occupants. Uh, thank you. That is the end of our speeches. Uh, one of our panelists uh, uh, is uh, absent and now uh, we have the time for the uh, round of questions and answers. If you have questions, you are welcome, please. Well, uh, no questions, so thank you to our speakers. I have one question to Mr. Gennady. You said that uh, Donetsk religious uh, Judaic community has been moved to Kiev almost uh, completely, and they have their own synagogue. I heard that the whole community was resettled. Uh, can you tell us more details? Thank you very much for your question. Donetsk uh, Judaic community was very big in 2014. Uh, from the time of the Revolution of Dignity and the warfare, we, uh, the first months the community tried uh, to stay there. There were only few cases of uh, movement, but when the warfare intensified, everyone understood that there was no chance uh, to live there because of the warfare. The blackmail cases happened, and the warfare situation it intensifies the activities of radical and anti-Semitic forces. That is why people there were very realistic. If a person had any chance to leave, they lived. So uh, Jewish communities in the territory uh, of Ukraine controlled by government, um, they helped uh, Jew Jews with resettlement. So uh, very many uh, Jewish uh, residents of Donbass, they resettled from Donbass to other uh, cities uh, uh, of Ukraine or to Israel. Uh, the most uh, uh, of people now uh, who are IDPs uh, uh, and Jews, uh, they live in Kiev, Dnipro, and uh, other Jitomer and other cities. Uh, the chief rabbi lives in Padol district of Kiev. Thank you very much. I would like also 
to ask a specifying question to the representative of Muslim Church. You said that um, there is no Muslim community in the occupied territories, but what did you mean, Crimea or Donbass? What is the situation, what is the status now in Crimea? Those Muslims uh, who uh, are canonic uh, Muslims, are they persecuted in Crimea? First of all, I said that there are no religious um, communities of Muslims there because when in Crimea, uh, in Donbass, uh, there were attempts to re-register our community so, the, so that they can work formally. Uh, the Muslims uh, uh, were attempted uh, to become uh, informers of the authorities, but Muslims uh, denied. Uh, that is why Muslims uh, are mostly forced to leave uh, Crimea. Uh, there are some other communities, Muslim communities there, but they are not of our confession. There are some other also communities, but they also are not our members. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, your questions. I have a question to Father Alexei Petrov. As uh, advocates, uh, in 2015 and 16, uh, we registered in the Netsk region uh, some meetings, some rallies near the Greek Catholic Church uh, building. Uh, this way they incited hatred and violence. Whether the Greek Catholic members, church members, now feel any similar attempts to marginalize them these days? What is the situation now? Uh, do they try to um, this incitement? Do they feel this incitement of hatred? Thank you for your question. The fact which you mentioned, which is a public fact, it could be characterized as a peak of uh, special ideological attack on Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, which followed uh, the public statements uh, by the leadership of uh, these uh, so-called people's republics, uh, the, uh, saying that everything which happened in the occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions and in Ukraine in general is a problem which uh, was initiated by uni aids together with the splitters, so-called. So there were some he heretics who were guilty. After this ideological attack against Greek Catholic Church communities in the occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, uh, they stopped. There was only that fact of attack which is uh, publicly known. Now our communities continue to operate. Their life is not easy. We cannot tell about all the facts for uh, known reasons, but still we have believers, uh, churchgoers, who are members of our church. And we hope that the situation will not uh, worsen. 
and by joint efforts by appealing to the international community and also to the occupational regime, saying that there are some limits which could not be uh, overcome. Uh, when we address them, uh, we can change it for better. We hope so, so that we provide the people the uh, opportunity to exercise freedom of uh, uh, conscience. The most uh, severe persecutions were in March, February of 2014. Uh, the representatives of church who uh, supported uh, Maidan revolution in Kiev and Maidan revolution in Crimea, they were visited with uh, specific threats uh, that either you leave or you will be criminally persecuted. And we know people who left those days upon these threats. Uh, they were given only two, three days. Uh, they were said that either they would be arrested or they should leave. In the context of the topic of our news conference, I would like to say that on April 29th, the USA Commission uh, uh, found the fact that uh, uh, the Russian Federation should be uh, uh, given the status of special concern and the commission of the uh, USA on the uh, religious freedom uh, now call on uh, the Russian Federation. The results, we have results and we will have more results. We remember that when we use joint efforts by the government, the international community, when they joined their forces, they managed to liberate the prisoners. I'm giving the floor to Ms. Alexandra. I would like to thank all those who are present, our speakers. Once again, I would like to call on uh, to provide joint answers to those uh, challenges that Ukraine and people face, those people who live in the occupied territories. We will be grateful for cooperation in the context of future work of the round table on religious freedoms, and we are open to any initiatives and proposals. Thank you very much. Vasin Andriy, um, public television of Donbass. Um, can the conflict between Felaret and Epifani bring some conflict? Uh, so this is not the topic of our press conference. We will speak about it separately. Maybe we will have special event to discuss this question. We thank all of you, and we wish you all the best to have the nice day and the whole week.